Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm here with Dave McAllister, and um, he's going to talk about open source maturity modeling. Uh, is this is that project ready for you? So, um, brief introduction. Dave has started with open source before it was called open source, beginning with new compilers and Linux uh, 0.93. He was named one of the top 10 pioneers in open source by Computer Business Review. And he's also been part of 11 startups, as well as large companies like Adobe, Red Hat, and Splunk. They says that when he's not talking, you can find him hiking the hills of Northern California with his camera and trying to keep up with his wife. So now, Dave, I'll leave the stage to you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Deborah, for a great introduction. And thanks for joining me today. Let me um, cue my slides up here, if you will. And um, presentations to that one. So, um, so yes, I work for a company called Nginx. I work on the open source side of the house, uh, but I've been in, in open source for quite a while now, um, starting with a lot of Linux work um, in the late nineties and moving on from that. But today I'm gonna talk about um, some things that are pretty important around open source and some of the aspects around open source. So let's see here with that. Okay. Come on. Button's not working. There we go. So uh, there we go. Come on. So right now what we've seen is a big shift in the sort of the, the way the world is working. Then every journey cloud is basically on this cloud journey. Um, oops for that. And we're moving from this lift and shift, but part of what's powering all this is our open source side of the house. Um, for some reason, my buttons are not clicking and this is not the right, why isn't this the right presentation? Sorry, this is the wrong presentation. Let me requeue this. Okay, this feels better. Um, and so when we're looking at this, we, we are all familiar with open source and its concepts. And open source is really great. It's very innovative. It drives most of our innovations these days. It's exciting. It's easily available. No licensing fees, use it. But part of the problem is when we start going into the production environments where we're looking at uh, things like scaling and we really start worrying about how things run and how often, you know, it, we don't want things to break inside of here. So we need to start asking some additional questions that are important in an open source space. Generally speaking, we expect that companies, if they're delivering a product to us, have already worried about this. That's not always true, but nonetheless, we make that assumption. So honestly, with open source, are, is it ready for your prime time? Is it ready for your production environments? Is it stable? Is it supported? Or is it advancing? Or is it, has it stalled out so that no one is currently working on this? Just over the last you know, year, we've seen projects that we found that only one person was working on the project. And that person stops, and all of a sudden, that project goes away. We're seeing that right now in the Linux kernel itself with some discussions around supporting um, file systems. Uh, we're seeing uh, that happen with uh, groups that are basically saying, you know, everybody's using my code, but it, it's not helping me, so I'm not going to do it anymore. And so these are some of the issues that you have to consider when you're looking at what the open source code means when you adopted targeting a production environment. And it really depends on where you are and what kind of company is driving here. And this is the crossing the chasm, um, which it, it Jeffrey Moore did a few decades ago. And it sort of separates us into people who are risk takers and people who are not risk takers. But when we look at this in an open source space, we have our early adopters and these guys, they're looking for that competitive edge. They want that pushing that innovation curve here. They're willing to do all of their own things for this. They, you know, support, they'll, they'll read the code. Documentation, they'll read the code. 
here. And from their viewpoint, clunky can be a little charming because you get to do the cool things and get to change things around. Pragmatist, which are the other side of this, are, are companies that can't afford necessarily to take that risk. And sometimes that's because they are um, restricted by requirements. Uh, sometimes it's that they just don't want to. Uh, an e-commerce shop that depends on a project product that doesn't work may lose millions of dollars a, a minute even. The, the large ones are literally that, that important. And so they've got to have things that are fully functional, that are easy to use, that there's somebody they can go say, fix this. And in general, because they're also working and bringing in large groups of people, they want a lot of really good documentation to show up at the same point in time. But maturity models help us. Now, the concept of maturity models is not actually not new. Sorry, it's 6 a.m. for me, so I'm drinking a little coffee. Um, they've been around for a while. And when we look at the first one, the first one is, is really this uh, thing that was called the SEI's Capability Maturity Model, which was put in place for the United States Department of Defense to figure out how capable their contractors were. But in 2003, we started seeing these adapt to open source um, both the product side um, as well as the technology sides for here. And the first one, really popular one, came from Capgemini. Um, in 2004, one came from Navica. Um, and then you'll, you'll see if you've got any background in this, is this is the adaptation of where I started. And then on down here. In about 2008, they kind of fell out of favor because everybody said, oh, well, open source is done. It's now, no, don't have to worry about it anymore. Open source is done. Starting about... 2016, what we found was that we had a new class of open source coming into play and that all of a sudden our maturities were varying across the board wildly. And so what happened was we started developing, redeveloping these models with some changes that were particularly around how communities and con contributions, how foundations and companies play a role. So common elements, first of all, the maturity model should tell you what it is now and should let you describe what you would like it to be. So that's the current state and the desired state. And then when you break it down into some of the, the broad brush stroke issues, does it do what you want it to, the functionality? Is it tested and quality assurance so that you know that is stable in environment? And then What's the risk in using this, the risk reward profile? And then how usable is it? Because that can also vary to the people that you're delivering this to. So break it down. So there are three assessments that kind of get made inside of here. And they are, what are the product elements? That's the first one here. And that starts breaking out what is important to you. Performance, can it scale? Does it work correctly? Do I have license conflicts? That's something that we always worry about when we look at open source here. And do we have updates that are on a regular basis? And do we have roadmaps that we can see where things are going? And so when you start looking at these, some of these are more important than others at all times. For instance, works correctly is probably on the top of everybody's list. If you're looking at an open source project, you want it to do what you want it to do. You also probably want to make sure that it's usable by the person to which it's intended. And that person could be an end user model, or it could be um, a, a, a DevOps, SRE, platform ops. So it depends on where things are here. One of the things that's worth noting is that, that when you start looking at updates, you probably want your updates for production not to happen every third day. You probably don't want to be rolling product every every three days, so forth. So you want to know when the updates are going to happen, um, as well as the direction to which things are going. The second one is gets into where you want things to be. So the first one is describing the current state. The second one is actually describing, in a sense, taking the current state, how important each piece is. And this gives us that desired state concept. So is performance important to you? You know, Do you need this to scale rapidly with elastic and ephemeral behavior um, in a cloud environment? Um, you know, and then will it be there next year becomes one of those, those more challenging pieces 
um, as well. And then in a sense, uh, the phrasing here is, is it hot? But is it popular? Or is it popular because it's useful? Or is it popular because somebody said the magic word about you know Acme Anvil software or whatever, and everybody piled onto it? And it's not necessarily useful, but it became the top topic for that. So once we've done the weighting factors for this, again, that describes my desired state for my identify points, and then go to the overall score. And the overall score is pretty easy here. Item scores, which is a rate times this, the, the weight, the rating times the weight, the sectional scores of these, add those up and divide them by the number of items inside of here, and then sum those final pieces together. And so it's pretty straightforward to look at that. But let's take a like it take it down a little bit. Not all of these apply to every project. Um, very honestly, these are product factors that I've used, and I, when I get to to show you the the example here, so we look at things like packaging. Does it come in a nice, clean little package that I can simply install, or am I going to have to build this, find all the dependencies, and put it in play here? Uh, am I going to end up having to train everybody, or is there some place that I can go point people to where they can get an understanding? of what the project does and how to make work inside of that. Do I need to integrate it to other projects? This becomes really important, especially in our modern um, apps architecture, where we are looking at um, cloud type environments with microservices, with services that cloud providers are providing us. How easy can I integrate it to other products here? What are its dependencies? No product these days stands completely by itself. Almost every project I touch has some level of dependencies that, that are important. Those dependencies also may have maturity issues that you need to look at for that. Then does it do what I want it to, to do, the functionality? So is it coded nicely or is it, you know, somebody uh, took a COBOL program from the uh, 60s and rewrote it into Rust? Um, is it designed in a way that makes sense here? And does the architecture actually meet to the type of environment that I'm putting it in? A couple of them that, uh, that will vary a little bit. Documentation and usability. In general, we really do want good documentation, but quite often, if it's not an, an in-user face project and it's a stable long-term project, um, such, such as Samba, which is a open source, uh, that lets Linux and uh, Microsoft's file systems talk, we probably not necessarily need really great docs. They're nice to have, but it's pretty intuitive and it's pretty easy to start up here. And usability. Again, if the usability aspect of this is at my developer level and my end users will never see it, my usability constructs are very different. So, those are some of the product factors. You may have others. You may have other pieces that are important to you. The new piece that sort of crept into this, this place, we used to look at this purely as a technology and code base. But what's happened now is we are seeing more and more where, where the community, the leadership are coming into play here. And also sort of the momentum. Um, flashback to 2015, in July and Kubernetes was launched to the world. Um, it was based on a, a project called Borg out of, out of Google, but Kubernetes came out and there were a lot of competitors for about a year and a half, but Kubernetes kind of managed to sort of wipe them all out. Kubernetes kind of rules the roost for container orchestration here. Part of that was momentum. There were a lot of players behind this. Uh, and part of this was the fourth bullet down, corporate commitment. And this was backed by a lot of very powerful, very large companies. But part of that also was a leadership and a culture where this was an open source project. This wasn't led by corporations. This was actually open source work and driven that way. So it became a very vital project. It started with a maturity model. So it actually started with something that had been running for years for this. And it didn't need as much in user support because it was mostly in the realm of, of DevOps SRE space. So really in the operational space, not exposed to the end users. 
But nonetheless, some of these things become incredibly important today because our projects are becoming bigger and bigger. Even something like Hyperledger, the Linux Foundation's Hyperledger Foundation, started with, I think, one major project is now 12 or 13 projects wide. And so our culture and our leadership becomes an impact on where our project is going and how successful our projects are. So you've now seen sort of a requirement base here. You get to define your requirements. And I'm not going to tell you that I gave you a comprehensive list. I gave you the list that I use when I'm looking at projects. It's a great starting point. But there may be other things that come into play. Ability to support MQTT as a messaging protocol. Once you've done that, you get to move to the really hard part which is locating the resources that answer some of these questions that you're talking about. And that varies wildly. I mean, I really do mean wildly across projects for that. You decide how available those pieces of information are. So are they easy to find or are they hard to find for that? And then assign a score, look through that material, and then you get to pick, pick the, the scores. This is the more challenging part. There are groups that will tell you what the scores should be, but they don't know what you are doing. So always be careful when you start looking at breaking down those, those items because they're not your environment. Open source is great because we can tailor it to what our specific needs are. Likewise, this the maturity modeling should do the same thing to reflect, once again, what we want things to be. And so when we look at this, you're going to be able to assign sort of the score as well as what your desired score looks like. So then the that's, that's sort of the scoring piece. The next piece is that weighting factors piece that I talked about, and this gets into that desired state how important each of those pieces are to you so you take the factors list and you may come back and say you know performance is the most important thing to me and therefore i'm going to give it a rating of five out of one to five or you know i don't really care about documentation so documentation is going to be a one or even a zero and each of these pieces lets me start defining what i want to see as my desired state where things should be in the future, what would be perfect for my my project. Again, this is not looking at a feature by feature basis. This is looking at the code across the environment. So here's my example. Um, before I started with Nginx, I haven't been with Ng I've not been with Nginx for a year at this point in time. I took one of the Nginx open source projects. The Nginx has a number of open source projects. They're most people know is for the reverse proxy web server um, bit. There's also one called Nginx JavaScript, um, but this one's called Nginx Unit. And Unit is a, an open source universal web app, multi-language support. It can serve static assets. It can run the application code. It provides a proxying functionality. And when I started looking at this, and this was literally looking at it from the outside world, here i started finding resources and the resources were challenging i i will flat out tell you right now this was not easy to, to parse out for here so you know the place i really started was github so yes there is an nginx slash unit on github for here and it turns out that it mirrors to mercurial so mercurial was sort of the next stop mercurial is great at lots of lots of things but it doesn't really give you great levels of insights. GitHub gives you the insights. It doesn't really show you all the characteristics easily. Um, and so I started digging through Mercurial a little bit and started trying to figure out things here. And then I said, hmm, let's just go check the website. And the website had some really great information. It shows me um, this new section, which gave me all of the release schedules and gave me into the release notes. And so that helped me a lot with the feature sets. I also went to the third party um, uh, discussion sites, uh, Stack Overflow and Reddit in particular, and started looking for information that was referring to Nginx unit. And that was actually a little bit light because most of the work turned out to be in the mailing list. And the mailing list is 
an incredible source of information, but took a fair amount of time to parse. It's not broken down for you. There's nobody's gone through and scraped the metrics off the mailing list for you. So between the mailing list and the change logs uh, provided the vast majority of the, of the information that was of interest to the discussion. There were some other, other sources of information that came out. I looked at blogs. I looked at, at um, answers that were coming in um, that, that came into various third-party sites. But all those things were challenging. I will uh, flat out tell you, this was not trivial to do. Um, and it, it took a while. And so when I looked at it, I broke this down into sort of the categories here, the Nginx X unit maturity model. And I started with functionality. So functionality, does it support multiple languages? Um, did it do reverse proxying and feeds correctly? Does it handle configuration data and changes for application spaces? Does it give me information coming back inside of that? And because of the functionality, it's fairly high. So I, I gave that a ranking of 4.1. It's a pretty capable system here. And my weighting, because I really do want it to, to work correctly, I gave us a four for that. And though, so you can see what's going over there. The fourth column was one I added specifically for me, which was the percentage um, that was happening of the, the functionality capability to the overall score. And this was just so that I could quickly look at this and see uh, which ones were green and which ones were red. Because as we all know, uh, dashboards sell executives on, on projects. And so you can see, quick look, there's a lot of green, there's only one red. And so going down for each of these things here, there were some interesting things in here. Testing. I wanted to know how it was tested. I could, and, and honestly, testing is fairly important, not tremendously important, but testing is fairly important for this. So I get a decent rating, but it's a lower number. And the reason for that is I couldn't find the testing processes I have since then. But at that point in time, I couldn't find them. And because of that, it became a lower number for the overall testing structure because I didn't know what they were testing. I could tell you that in several information sets, they are testing, they state they're testing, but I couldn't find what the test structures look like. And unit tests usually are available. If you go in and dig into it, you'll find them. But was the overall program tested? Usability looked good. Packaging was great. I mean, it was available. I could just grab a grab a package and run it. And so that was that was kind of cool. But when we got into the people side of the things, and while they weren't necessarily red flags in all cases, a couple of things came out here. So leadership and culture. This was an Nginx project. It was basically a walled garden, a single vendor open source project. Nginx made the decisions. Nginx leaded. There was no real developer community. There was a um, user community, but there was not really a developer community. And that showed up in the next two, the community maturity and community um, uh, vitality. They both were definitely in user focused rather than developer or innovation focused. And then dropping it down to the next one, looking at the talent pool, people that actually already knew this project I could hire was abysmal. There was not a lot of people who had spent a lot of time working with the unit. And as you can see on down here, there were some interesting ones that also popped out. Momentum. There was in the discussion chats, there was a lot of discussion around its capability set. There was also a lot of discussion around the need for app servers. As we move through that maturity model of going from monolith out to the cloud, app servers help us along the way. And so it gives us the ability to, to really drive forward for that. And then you can see scoring. Um, but this was also very honestly, took a while. This was not easy data to come through. By the way, if you try to do something with a, a particular project, like somebody asks you to do maturity modeling for open telemetry, um, start drilling into what they want because there's a lot of moving pieces in open telemetry and you can't come up with a meaningful aspect for something that's a couple of hundred projects wide. So you have to look at the projects at a different basis. So what's the catch? Well, 
maturity models really do oversimplify things. They make things in a way that that look nice and clean, but that's not necessarily bad. When we have complexity um, in an environment, something if you're familiar with what's called the Kinevan framework, we have complexity and we can have chaos. And the problem is, is that complexity can lead to chaos here. And so we need to be able to simplify it now. If you're familiar with, you know, watching metrics, monitoring your, your systems activity, there's a difference between looking at a dashboard, which is doing the aggregation and visualization of your metrics for you versus trying to watch the data stream as it's coming in a live feed from your systems. Maybe you can do this, but if you're running, you know, uh, a thousand uh, uh, nodes of a Kubernetes environment on um, a particular public cloud, you're not going to be able to watch all the data. So we need to be able to simplify so that we can see what's going on. We also do need to be able to drill in where things are indicated. And so maturity models uh, indicate where we need to drill in. Just like I talked around with testing, you need to be able to drill into these pieces here. Maturity models also assume there's really only one pathway that gets you from a current state to a desired state. And that's also not true. There are lots of ways to get to what we want as a desired state. As an example, maybe there's not great documentation, but that doesn't mean that we can't start putting together run books based on our experience that provide documentation for us. And in an open source space, sharing that type of information becomes really great because it helps other people get started with the project, leading to better maturity for it, as well as it encourages others to also share that information, leading to better maturity aspects for us. And the nice thing is that open source model, by sharing this information and by sharing the pathway that we are on, lets others expand and, and add to that. So we can learn from what's happened before. We can help make the path better for others that are following us. And maturity models show us that there is a path or a direction that we all can go into successfully. And then finally, maturity models actually assume that there's an end state. So again, starting state, current state, desired state. And maturity models make that assumption that the desired state is the end state. And if we ever reach that, everything is perfect. That doesn't really exist. There is no nirvana for our open source projects. Software never stops. The world never stops. The code that we were writing in, in the year 2000 is not the code that we're writing today. In fact, quite often, it's not even the same languages that we were doing uh, work in for that. It is very indicative of current trends. And so what we're actually looking for is a state that we would like to have to start. That's the desired state, but it also indicates the trends, the directions that the project may be moving in, in such a way that we can get more information about, is this a direction? Is this a journey that we ourselves want to undertake? <clears throat> so kind of summing up here, open source maturity models give you that framework for comparison. They are okay if they're using one for a project. You can feel get a comfort feeling around your risk analysis of this. They are even better when they are used as a comparison tool to projects with similar functionality can give you a very different maturity model rating and can help you make a choice between one or the other of those projects. Open source maturity models can also help your own open source projects. For instance, the Nginx work that, that I uh, pulled together, Nginx unit work, before I came to the Nginx, has helped us look at unit and helped us start advancing some of the concepts that say, let's build a innovation-focused community. Let's build a developer-focused community. Let's look at explaining what our testing processes look like and how we test this for production values here. But finally, there's no silver bullet. There's no model that's going to simply tell you, oh, this is perfect, use it now. And because of this, you can't treat this as uh, a tool that, that allows you to say safe or risky um, onto the project. 
there's no maturity bullet inside of this. There are maturity indicators and there are things that map to your specific needs here. And so when you look at this, maturity models are a tool. They're only useful when they are used appropriately. It's best on using it for comparison to other projects or to point out an acceptable risk point that you can feel comfortable that, that the project and its community are important. That community has changed. Our communities, when, when open source really got on the ground, were individuals. Our communities are now companies and foundations. And so we need to make sure that the risk that we're accepting is the risk that we intend to accept. And with that, I thank you for listening. Uh, my LinkedIn information, if you want to drop me a line, that's, that's great. And let me turn this over and see if there are any um, questions that are coming up. Okay, thank you very much. It was very enlightening, Dave. Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Yeah, right, uh, thank you. Drop. Yeah. Uh, this was really enlightening. Um, uh, we don't have any questions yet. Um, but I, I was wondering why you were talking. Uh, there's a lot of information that we need to gather. Uh, what do we do if we can't find uh, one or other piece of information? Oh, wow. That's a that's a great question. So when you start looking at, at information and information sources, there are, I'm going to give you two answers to that. If you can't find information in general, that is a red flag. So that means that people are, are actively hiding things from you. In an open source world, hiding things is never a good idea. And so if I can't find information, I really am, am going to say, I'm going to go look for someplace else. It's going to have to be a very unique project for me to do otherwise. If it's a particular piece of information, like I had with testing, um, some of this is becomes a, what I call derived model. Um, so again, I could find mentions where um, inside of release notes, testing was done and passed successfully, but I couldn't find the details. And so I then had to sort of make my choice, which says, do I trust the testing authority or not? And so it, with Nginx, Nginx is an open source project that's been around forever. Um, you know, the engineering teams are brilliant. Um, so I kind of trusted what they were doing, but I gave them a lower score. And so, you know, that, that becomes the two things. But I will flat out tell you, if you can't find any information on something, it gets a zero. It's a zero weighting. Um, and keep that in mind. If you get a lot of zeros because people are hiding information from you, there's something in there you do not want to touch. Go someplace else. Okay, thank you. And um, you mentioned uh, a lot of uh, foundation projects. You uh, mentioned Kubernetes. Uh, why, in your opinion, uh, do they do better than single company projects? Um, so interestingly enough, again, sort of when we started open source, it was all individual based. And, you know, I, I pick on Samba. Um, Jeremy Allison, Andrew Tridgewell pretty much did all of the Samba code. And now Samba is a a larger group, there's 40 major, 40 principal contributors and hundreds of people. Linux, when it started, was Linus. And now Linux is thousands of people here. But when we get into the modern timeframes, our projects have become complex and we need to have support across them. And so open source becomes sort of the de facto standard if there are not, not people backing them. It's also kind of nice when you you know, picking on Kubernetes a little bit here. So Kubernetes started out of a Google project, but, you know, Microsoft piled in here. Go to any public cloud. There's a Kubernetes environment that's right there. But all these companies need to work together because if they don't, we don't have a Kubernetes project. We have splintered lots of other little projects inside of here. And that becomes important because uh, as we saw in the early days of Linux, there were, you know, two or 300 different named Linux distributions and about, you know, of those, there were probably five 
major incompatible groupings. You couldn't move Linux from here to a different version of Linux because the file system locations varied, you know, slash uh, user slash etsy versus slash etsy and all sorts of interesting pieces. Foundations have stabilized that companies join to make everything better. And therefore the foundation gives us the ability to innovate in a stable environment. It also means that if a company decides to stop doing it, it doesn't go away. Um, and I'm sure that it, you know, people in the session can point to some favorite project that somebody simply decided to stop doing or change the license on um, or decided to take it in some direction that they didn't, you know, that the company needed, but the community didn't. And so foundations have stabilized to that. And so we've gone from this individual project to company projects and they still exist, but where we're seeing most interesting activities are in foundations, cloud native computing foundation, you know, Kubernetes foundation, Hyperledger foundation, um, all these things have, have changed the nature because one of the really cool things about open source is that we all get to work together and the companies themselves have learned that working together to improve these projects means that everybody does better. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there aren't any new questions. Cool. Uh, so I think we can uh, close up a little earlier than expected. Uh, but if anyone is just shy to use the chat, um, we can find uh, Dave in the in the lounge for the next few minutes. Yep. And, right. Thanks. And I thank y'all for listening to me uh, bright and early in my morning. And y'all have a great rest of the uh, conference. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye-bye.